thank you for that amazing welcome. It's wonderful to be here with you. And um, I bring you lots of greetings and love from the UK. Um, I don't know if you realize what amazing people you have as your leaders here, Miles and Sarah, are some of our closest friends and we really, really miss them in the UK church. But we're so thrilled to hear reports of what God is doing here. And we've been praying for this church from uh, months before the decision was even made to, for, for these guys to move here. And it's a massive privilege to share this time of worship with you. So I want to um, speak to you for a few moments this morning on who Jesus is. We're going to be looking at one phrase in particular that he speaks in John's Gospel. So if you have a Bible, you may want to open it to chapter 8. But I want to begin with a question. I wonder what you think when you hear that name, Jesus. Who do you really think Jesus is? Now, an honest description of somebody, an honest answer, can be a very dangerous thing. In a trial that took place in a law court in the South, in America, in Mississippi, uh, a small town prosecuting lawyer was doing his first ever trial. He called his first witness a rather sort of grandmotherly lady to the stand, and he thought, you know, I'm a bit nervous as I approach her. I'm going to ask her a really easy question, first question. So he said, Mrs. Jones, do you know me? She responded, oh, yes, I do know you, Mr. Williams. I've known you since you were a boy, and frankly, you've been a big disappointment. You lie, you cheat on your wife, you manipulate people, you talk about them behind their backs. You think you're a big shot. You haven't the brains to realize you'll never amount to anything more than a two-bit paper pusher. Yes, I know you. The lawyer was stunned, not knowing what to do or how to recover. He pointed across the courtroom and said, Mrs. Jones, do you know that defense lawyer over there, Mr. Bradley? She said, oh, yes, I've known him since he was a youngster. He's lazy, bigoted, and he has a drinking problem. He can't build a normal relationship with anyone. His law practice is one of the worst in the entire state, not to mention he cheated on his wife with three women, and one of them was your wife. Yes, I know him. The defense lawyer, Mr. Bradley, turned a very dark shade of purple. At that point, the judge asked both lawyers to approach the bench, and in a very quiet voice, he said, if either of you two idiots asks her if she knows me, I'll send you both to the electric chair. <laughs> I wonder what your honest description, your honest answer would be to the question, who Jesus really is. Many people suffer from a case of mistaken identity, a sense that they're not fully known or understood, but perhaps no one more than the person of Jesus. In Britain, where I live, his name is used by many people as a swear word. I was leading a mission in the University of Nottingham last year. And we met students who'd come to study in the UK from China. And when they were asked by my team, what do you think of Jesus? They looked a bit surprised. They had honestly never heard the word Jesus other than as a swear word, an expletive used by the British students around them. But doesn't Jesus at least deserve our attention? My colleague, Tom Price, wrote this. He said, one person in 60 billion who stands out deserves a second look. The world's chronology is linked to his birth, and yet we don't know the exact date of his birth. He never wrote a book himself, but more books have been written about him than about anyone or anything else. And one film based on his recorded words has been translated into over a hundred languages. And it's the film that more people have seen on earth than any other film. The book that contains the eyewitness accounts of Jesus' life and death is the most success successful literary creation ever. It's been more influential than Shakespeare or other great texts. It's the world's bestseller. 44 million copies of the Bible sell every year. One historian wrote this. He said, 
Jesus of Nazareth, without money and arms, conquered more millions than Alexander, Caesar, Mohammed, and Napoleon. Without science, he shed more light on things human and divine than all philosophers and scholars combined. Without the eloquence of schools, he spoke such words of life as were never spoken before or since. And he produced effects on people that are beyond the reach of orator or poet. Without writing a single line, he set more pens in motion and furnished the themes for more sermons, orations, discussions, volumes, works of art, and songs than the whole army of great men of ancient and modern times. Who do you think Jesus is? Well, at the beginning of this new year in January, as we're here looking into the year, and, pre and some of us in this room are going to be baptized today, and I'm sure some are here supporting those who are choosing baptism. We can take the advice of the writer uh, of the letter of Hebrews. He said this, look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. Let Jesus shape you. Let Jesus shape your year. And as we do that, we're going to focus in on one particular statement that Jesus made. John's Gospel, chapter 8 and verse 12. Jesus Christ said this, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Darkness is an interesting word. It's an interesting description of the reality around us. In our world, we hear about all kinds of different darkness. We're surrounded by the systematic sexual and physical abuse of hundreds of thousands of young people caught up in human trafficking. We see pictures of the beheading of professional journalists and aid workers with a butcher's knife on our internet TV and TV screens. And while many of us in this room will have had lots of happy experiences and continue to do so, we know that darkness is real. It's around us. We may struggle with feelings of anxiety or disappointment, perhaps with the broken relationships around us, or as we struggle to process the violations that we've experienced and that we see others experience. The darkness of our world is real. In this last year, um, one of my friends lost her child. She's walked through a veil of darkness. Another of my friends has just begun to speak about, for the first time, he's in his 40s, for the first time ever, begun to speak about the abuse that he experienced as a child. For him, darkness is real. The question of darkness is of critical importance. And so it may come as a surprise when we think about it, when we think about the suffering world, that the Bible doesn't deny the reality that you and I know and experience. Often when people think about faith, they see faith as a sort of fantasy. It's an embracing of unreality. And it will help you get through the pain of life, sort of lift you up for a little while, maybe like a drug that lifts you for a bit, or a sort of comfort blanket of fantasy. But the faith the Bible describes is not a denial of reality. Jesus Christ enters the world that you and I know, a world in which there is joy and love, but also a world in which terrible and sad things happen to ordinary people. There's no denial of reality. I have um, three children, as Miles said, and Miles and Sarah are godparents to my youngest, Benji, who's six years old. But my older two children are twins, and they're old boys, so I have three boys in the house. And um, when, they were, when they were younger, we heard this story. 
um, from someone uh, connected to the school. A little girl um, had gone to her mother after school and said, Mummy, how did I come to be born? The question came up because that was being talked about and she was being asked to do a project on birth. Now the mother was embarrassed, she wasn't ready to explain to her six-year-old child how the world works, how babies are made. And so she just fumbled it and she said, well darling, a stork, a bird, brought you to our house, you were wrapped up in a blanket and dropped you into our back garden and I caught you. The girl looked really, really concerned and she said, Mummy, how did you come to be born? And the woman, you know, was unable to stop digging at this point. She still was not ready to have the conversation. She said, well, darling, a bird, a stork brought me wrapped up in a blanket and Granny caught me in the garden. And it was the same for Granny as well. <laughs> the girl looked worried and she went back to school. She wrote the next day in her project on birth, there hasn't been a natural birth in our family for three generations. <laughs> We all avoid things. Many of our friends, those that we share life with, want to avoid talking about pain, talking about darkness. Jesus doesn't do that. He doesn't say, come to me and pretend. Come to me and embrace a way of looking at the world that is totally disconnected from how things really are as you experience them. He doesn't say, come to me and start going to church and put that religious face on and be better and reach this standard and be good and project yourself as good. He doesn't say that at all. That's what religion says. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. He names darkness as a reality that needs to be dealt with. And he claims that he is the one who can deal with it for us and with us. Do you know, part of my job um, involves talking to people who are skeptics, talking to people who have other faiths, giving talks in contexts that might be hostile to the Christian faith in political arenas or academic settings. And time and time again, this one aspect of who Jesus Christ is, that he does not deny reality as we know it. He doesn't say moral categories don't exist in absolute terms, like atheism tells us. He doesn't say, well, just stop, stop desiring anything. Stop wanting anything. Like teachers of other great religions might say. And if you stop wanting anything, then that will deal with the pain of the world. Just embrace nothingness. He says, no, darkness is real. I understand that. But there's light in the dark world. Darkness is real and it really hurts. But the good news is that light has come into the dark world. And Jesus makes this astonishing claim. He says, I am the light of the world. In claiming to be light, Jesus shows us that he understands, he knows what the human condition is. He knows that there isn't just darkness in our environment. It's not just on the internet that we see horrible things. And it's not just that people do horrible things to us. There's also darkness inside us. The brilliant Russian writer Alexander Solzhenitsyn was a poet and he wrote poetry um, during difficult times in Russia and he was imprisoned in a gulag. And while he was there, um, he met Christian pastors and saw um, in their lives something that he'd never experienced and through them he met Christ in the gulag and he wrote this he said if only there were evil people in the world somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us 
But he said, that's not the case. The line dividing good and evil cuts through every human heart. There's darkness out there. There's also darkness in here. And Jesus says, I'm the light. I'm the light of the world. I understand that. And I don't ask you to pretend that things are other than they really are. Coming to me is not embracing fantasy. Coming to me is not throwing your experience of the world and, and reality as you know it away utterly. Coming to me is facing reality but meeting the light, being transformed by the light. Now, light does all sorts of things. Light extinguishes darkness. In other words, the very presence of Jesus is enough to deal with the darkness inside us and the brokenness that we experience. Light does something else. Light opens our eyes. We see things much more clearly in the light. Have you ever had that experience? In fact, I had it last night, um, staying in, an, uh, in the hotel, and it's an unfamiliar room, and I, I, I got up in the night, and I was sort of fumbling around, not quite sure of where things were, and I, I found the light switch and switched it on, and, and suddenly I could see my way. It's a relief. There's clarity. There's truth in the presence of light. Light opens our eyes. Light reminds us also that we're not forgotten. Think about the relief the child feels when they're crying in bed in the darkness and the parent comes in and switches on the light. You're no longer alone. You're not forgotten. Into our dark hearts, light has come. The light can be a searchlight, a rescue light, that when we see, we realize, thank you, deliverance has come. Quite a few years ago, um, when Miles and Sarah and Frog and I first knew each other, we were involved in various mission trips. And on one of these trips, um, we were stuck in a desert, in a sandstorm in no man's land between two quite hostile countries. We'd been involved in um, Christian work in those countries. And we were trying to get back to where we'd come from using the route uh, that, that we'd used before. And the border guards wouldn't let us through. They wanted a bribe and being students, we didn't have any money. And <laughs> My, my husband did spend a while flicking through the book of Proverbs to see if there was a place where it's allowed, okay to give a bribe. We couldn't find it. And then Miles pointed out we haven't got the money anyway. We were stuck, utterly, utterly stuck in no man's land in a really frightening part of the world. And um, I don't know if you've ever been in a sandstorm, but it really, really hurts your face. I mean, I probably aged about 10 years in that, in that afternoon. And even though it was the afternoon, it was dark. You couldn't really see your hand in front of your face. It was, it was strangely frightening. We were stuck for hours. We were afraid. I will never forget, I don't know if you remember, the, the headlights appearing in the sandstorm as um, this Jeep owned by the Red Cross came through this border. They only came that route once every three months and they rescued us. In that moment, light told us, you're delivered, you're rescued. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He invites us to come to him, not with our church face on, not with our I've got it all together attitude, but in the reality of our darkness in the reality of the pain that we've experienced, in the reality of our need for that light, for rescue, for forgiveness. Ultimately, of course, as we've been singing about, Jesus does this by dying on the cross for us. His love, his light, overwhelmingly powerful 
as he offers his life for ours. And as he does that, at, at his point of greatest vulnerability, dealing with the darkness of the world, love pours out of him. Some of us, when we think about light, feel afraid. We think things are going to be exposed, things that I want to keep hidden. Keep hidden. But at the cross, we see the Son of God dying for us, love pouring out of him, even for those who are killing him. Mark's gospel tells us that this so staggered the Roman centurion responsible for Jesus' execution. Remember, a centurion was someone who was an expert in death, who would have seen thousands of crucifixions. And Mark tells us, when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. He loves us at our point of desperate need and darkness. He's the light of the world. My youngest son um, really suffers from car sickness. He's a, a brilliant little uh, sportsman, and that means that I have to drive him around to all kinds of um, events. I'm sure we've got other mums in this room who are constantly driving their children to, to events. But my Benji plays a lot of tennis, and he competes all over the country. And um, I was in the car a few months ago with his older brothers and him, and he'd done this competition, and we were driving home, and we stopped to get some food, and um, he, he just was not looking well at all. And we were standing in the queue at this, at this place, and uh, my twins, who've, who've sort of learned to read the signs, looked at me and said, Mommy, he's going to blow! <laughs> and they ran backwards as Benji erupted unwell in front of everyone. And without thinking about it, my instinct in that moment was to run towards him and gather him and hold him close, which meant that his illness was, you know, hair in my hair and all over me, but I just held him close. The twins were like, that is gross. <laughs> I thought about it afterwards and I thought, I realize I, I want to be the kind of mother who loves my children when they're successful, when they have the accolades, when they win, when they do well at school, when they're the champion on the court. But I also want my son to know I love him in the dark times. I want closeness with him when he's in difficulty. That's what Jesus does at the cross. He draws us close with our darkness, with our regrets, with the violations we've experienced. And he takes that upon himself. Love pours out of him. God holds us close through the cross. His love and his light meet us where we actually are. So as we finish, let's just think about what Jesus said. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. In other words, when we come to know Jesus, the light of the world, we're no longer held captive to darkness. When we meet Jesus, the light of the world, through his cross, he deals with the darkness within us. So will you come to him? Will you follow him? Will you invite him to deliver you from darkness? Some of us in this room have never done that. And today we can give God our shame, our guilt, our anxiety, our regrets. His light and love can free us and fill us. But some of us here today already know him. 
But the darkness has encroached. Things have happened to us. And we've perhaps done things. And, and we need Jesus, the light of the world, to deliver us today, to rescue us today, to cleanse us today. We need his light in our darkness. He's here and his arms of love, just as they were opened on the cross, are open to us today. So why don't we pray? Why don't you close your eyes and we're going to um, have a moment of silence. Just imagine Jesus, the light of the world, the son of God, who came into our darkness, who describes and experienced reality as we know it, and who offers to deal with it for us. And in the quietness of our hearts, why don't we invite him, perhaps for the first time, invite him, the light of the world, in. If you'd like to do that, it's really easy. He's only a prayer away. Nikki Gumbel often says, you know, a simple prayer, we can say, sorry, thank you, and please. We can say, sorry for, for the darkness in me. Thank you, Jesus for what you've done, and please come into my life. If you'd like to do that, why don't you just do that in the quietness right here this morning? I'm going to say a, a quick prayer, and if you'd like to echo it, why don't you echo it in your heart? Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for the darkness in me. Thank you for coming into the world as the light. Please forgive me. Please come into my life by your Holy Spirit. I want to follow you and never walk in darkness. For those of us who know him, but we sense that darkness encroaching again, why don't you just open your hands to him and say, come Holy Spirit, invite him to come. I sense that there are some here who have a very um, clear experience of darkness afflicting them, a kind of malevolence. Um, just afflicting them and, and thwarting God's plan for your life. And Jesus looks that darkness face on, head on, and he says, I am the light. Just pray for you that you would know his deliverance, his light.